Recording has started. Um, hello, Trashi uh, Delay all, and uh, welcome to this um, online uh, talk by uh, Dr. Martin Mills. Um, I understand some of you um, have been watching this on uh, Facebook Live uh, and some through the Tibet House Trust website, um, and some of uh, us joined here on Blue Jeans. Um, this talk is organized by uh, Tibet House Trust in London. And, um, and um, I would uh, request all of uh, those who have joined on Blue Jeans to mute their mic. And uh, it's their mic on the top. If you click on it, it will mute you. And uh, you can unmute it at the end when you want to ask questions. Um, during this talk, if you have got any questions, you can use the uh, Blue Jeans uh, chat box on the top right hand corner there and you can ask questions and um, I, I will call you uh, when it's time question and answer time I'll call you and you can ask question directly uh, those who are watching this live on Facebook um, I would also request you to ask question on Facebook and then um, Tibet House Secretary Sring Somala will pick up those questions and put it on the chat box and on your behalf I will be asking the question to uh, Dr. Martin Mills uh, now the program will be first uh, we will have a introduction by um, uh, representative Sonam Frasila and um, Sonam La will also introduce Dr. Martin Mills and then we will have a half an hour talk by Dr. Martin Mills and thereafter we will have around 20 minutes question and answer time. So over to you Sonam La. Hello. First of all, I would like to say uh, thank you and welcome for all the people who are um, in the uh, live in the webinar also for people who are also already following us on uh, uh, on our Facebook. Uh, yet again, the Office of Tibet is very honored to uh, host this educational webinar primarily dedicated to the Tibetan youths as part of our thank you, uh, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama year. This webinar is on the history of Tibet. The Communist China of Tibet, uh, Communist China, Communist Party of China is continuously doing everything to rewrite the history of Tibet to suit their narrative, narration and control of Tibetan affairs and build a false picture of Tibetan history. For the reasons and in order that Tibetans, young Tibetans are taught, get familiar and know our own history, the Office of Tibet in London has introduced a special history, Tibetan history lesson during our weekend Tibetan language school. Therefore, it is very important that young Tibetans growing up in the West with no access to Tibetan history lessons in your respective schools do get some formal introduction of Tibetan history. Today's special talk on Songten Kambo, the king whose name is, I'm sure, on the lips of every Tibetan, is revered by all Tibetans, is a further demonstration of our commitment to our younger and generation. I would like to thank Dr. Martin La and you all listening to us and giving your enthusiasm for learning. We will find other opportunities to introduce many other great Tibetan historical leaders, reformers, pioneers who have contributed to shape and build our Tibetan nation. So without saying much, I would like to say, Dr. Martin La, thank you so much. You have always been uh, very uh, kind to the Office of Tibet and you have been a 
staunch supporter of T Tibet and its culture. Uh, to say a few words on Dr. Martin as an introduction, because we have limited time, because if I have to expand what Dr. Martin is like, it will take me two years to go through his life history. So Dr. Martin La lectures on anthropology and Tibetan history and culture at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. He has been traveling and doing research in Tibet, Ladakh, Zankar, and the Dharamsala since 1986. He works for the Scottish Parliament as secretary of the cross-party group on Tibet and is director of Scottish Centre for Himalayan Research at Aberdeen University. He is the author of Identity, Ritual and State of Tibetan Buddhism in 2003, and he has written many research papers and is, he is on his way for uh, printing a book on Songden Kambo in the near future. And I'm told I must say that he likes Momo too much. But I think on top of Momo, he likes Tibetan history so much. So we have a huge wealth of a person who can share our history to us. Thank you so much, Martin. And thank you for all of you. Thank you from the Office of Tibet. Okay, I will speak in English now because my Tibetan is a little old. Um, uh, I have been asked to speak about Songsen Gampo. I'm sure all Tibetans know who Songsen Gampo is a little bit. Um, the problem is, it's very difficult to know so much about him. Songsen Gampo's life is like a huge cake. And today we can only have one little slice. So I must decide what to talk about today. Um, can I have the first slide? Okay. Uh, first of all, I have called this talk a King of Kings, Songsan Gampo, King of Kings, because Songsan Gampo is not just a Gyalpo, not just a Jelpo, not just a king, but he is a Tsenpo. He was a Tsenpo, an emperor. And he was emperor of the Tibetan Empire. 1,300 years ago, the Tibetan Empire, sometimes called the Pergyal Empire, dominated Central Asia. It was the most powerful military force in Central Asia. Um, and so it was also one of the great Buddhist centers of Asia at the time and later. Now, uh, can I have the next Recording slide? Recording is on. Now, for Tibetans themselves, I will talk a little bit about the question of this word, per or Tibet. Um, when Westerners use the word Tibet, they talk about the Tibetan plateau, the whole area. Um, for Tibetans themselves, there is a little subtle difference. Sometimes um, people from, for example, Amdo or Kham, when they use the word Per, it means a little area in southern Tibet. You can see here on the map, okay? That is actually quite a big area, um, but it isn't the whole of the Tibetan, the Tibetan plateau. The whole of the Tibetan plateau at the time um, and later was often called Per Chenmo, Greater Tibet. Okay, and if we need to understand what the difference between these two are, then we need to understand something of the life of Tsenpo or Emperor Songsen Gampo and how he built the Tibetan Empire. Now, this question of how one built a Tibetan Empire, the first thing I need to make is certain, particularly for our younger viewers, is the early period of the Tibetan Empire, before Buddhism came, was actually a very violent and brutal time. It was a very difficult time to be a king or a leader or anything on those lines. Very few leaders actually lived a whole life to their old age. Usually their enemies killed them. Okay, so this was a, a terribly difficult time, and it is only later that you see a, a, a change in that. So if you hear about a lot of people dying and being poisoned and everything on those lines, it is important to understand this was, this was a very difficult and brutal time. Okay. Um, okay, can I have the next slide, please? 
Thank you. Let's start with something simple. Uh, Songsen Gampo did not build the Tibetan Empire just by himself. Okay. Um, in fact, actually, the Tibetan Empire, when I use the word empire, I mean where one state or government rules over other governments or states. That thing actually began with his father and his grandfather. Um, and Songsen Gampo inherited it, expanded it, and made it strong and stable as a system. So to understand this, we need to know something a little bit about his father, Namri Songsen, and his grandfather, Takbu Nyazi. Okay. And between and how between them they founded the Tibetan Empire and set aside that whole area that we now call Tibet. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, let's have a little check. Um, this is a satellite picture of, of central Tibet, okay? Um, since all your microphones are muted, uh, we will just run through. Uh, if you see the big um, lake at the top there in the middle, that is, of course, Namso Lake. If you see the lake that looks like a scorpion down at the bottom, that is Yamdrokso Lake. The line that crosses across um, the bottom of the page, that line is a huge valley within which is the Yalong Tsangpo River. And up above it, on the right hand side, you can see the Kishu River. Just if you point with the, with the, with the thing, there we go, there's the Kishu, the Kishu River, and where Lhasa is today. Now down a bit. There we go, that's Meldro, that is the Yalang Tsangpo. And over to the right-hand side, just where the cursor is right now, um, over to the right-hand side, just go left a bit, there we go. Uh, perfect. Uh, this is the place called Yalang, okay? And here is where the history of Tibet, as it stands now, really, and the Tibetan Empire really begins. The Yalong Valley is a sort of very beautiful, sunny valley in southern Tibet. It has two sections to it. One is the Yalong Valley, the other is the Chonge uh, region. Um, and here, the first Tibetan, the first king of the Yalong dynasty, of the Pergel dynasty, really turned up and is the first. It's called, his name was Nyachitsangpo. Uh, Nyachitsangpo. And he is said to, we don't know, he is said to come from the sky, maybe from India, um, maybe from Eastern Tibet. We're not entirely sure. There is great debate about this. Um, and became the first Senpo or emperor of, uh, of the Yalong dynasty. Really a king, to be honest. Okay. Um, now, Songsen Gampo was the 33rd king of this dynasty. So a long time has passed. Um, and when Songsen Gampo came into this world, roughly speaking, at the beginning of the seventh century, um, we have some debate about precisely when he was born. We know he was born in, in Gyama, uh, near Lhasa. Uh, we know that it was at the beginning of the seventh century, uh, maybe 605, we're not sure, because we know he was born in the Ox year. But there is some debate about precisely what year he was born. He inherited a, uh, an empire that was that from his father that was in terrible trouble. So let's let's understand this because he held it all together, he put it back together, and he expanded it to include all of the Tibetan plateau. Okay, um, can I have the next slide? Thank you. Okay. Let's look at what central Tibet looked like at the time of Songsen Gampo's grandfather, Takbo Nyazi. Okay. Uh, you can see there in the green, that is the Yalong Valley area. Okay. To its north is another kingship, another kingdom called the Nepo, the Nepo king, uh, Kingdom. Okay. To the west, we have Tsangpa, which was under Marmon a king at the time, and way out in the west, over in the green there, we have Shangshong, 
Okay, the Shangsheng was probably at the time the largest political community on the Tibetan plateau. Maybe we call it an empire, maybe we call it a confederacy. It's difficult to work out. There's a lot of new research being done on this by some very, very good scholars. And the Shangsheng were really the dominant force in Tibet at the time. Um, and the Yalong Valley, where Tapunyazik was born, um, he was born quite close to the, the, the town of Chongye, where the ancient Tibetan kings were buried. That's why his name is Tapu. He, is the, he was born uh, uh, of the Tatsai Castle um, in Chongye. And he came to a world where the Changsheng Empire was very strong. And most of the kingships around it, including a little bit the Yalong kingship, were really just like little satellites of Shangsheng, okay? Particularly the Nepal um, kingdom to his north. This was ruled by a man called Gudri Jinpoche, okay? And Gudri Jinpoche was a strong ruler, um, but not a very popular one. In particular, he, made a lot of enemies by making very partial legal decisions. Um, he would make, run court cases because he was the local lord, and often he would um, make those cases in favor of people that he liked and against people that were from surrounding areas. And gradually, those people from surrounding areas, they sought refuge um, with in Yalong. All right, many of them fled to Yalong and they sought refuge with Takpu Nyazik, Songsen Gampo's grandfather. And finally, one day, they held a secret meeting in Takse Castle in Chongye. And they all got together and they said, You are the most powerful of us, Takpu Nyazik. If we fight against Nepal and we overcome Nepal, we will all become your servants we will all become you will become our lord okay and he agreed to this and started to, they started to make a plan to do this but this plan did not happen in his lifetime uh this was a time when to be married to someone was to make a political alliance and um Tapu Nyazik's wife was from the Ogil um group clan that were near Yam, Yamdrokso uh, Lake. And the Ogo clan heard about the plan, we think, and they decided to kidnap Tako Nyazik. And they kidnapped Tako Nyazik and they sold him to Lokar, the king of Lokar to the south. And as far as we know, that is how Tako Nyazik died. Okay, he died as a prisoner. And his rule in Yalong was taken over by his son, Namri Songsen. Okay, Namri Songsen, Songsen Gampo's father, took over not just the Yalong lands, he also took over the generals and the ministers of his father. And combined, they decided that they would continue Takbo Nyazig's vow to fight back against the Nepal kingdom to the north. And this they did, um, and they allied together with all of the surrounding clans that had been harmed by this, by, by the legal decisions of, 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 the, of Jinpoche. And they combined together and they fought against Nepal and overcame him, um, thus taking those territories to the north. Um, so in, in that one thing, Namri Songsen began the Tibetan Empire. He brought Nepal and Nyang to the uh, to the east, and Dwak, and a variety of other small clans, all underneath his authority. Okay, uh, he was a young man, but he was very, very he was a very powerful leader and very successful militarily, and he had a a variety of generals, people like Nyang from the from the west, uh, Kumpo from, uh, from the Tsang district. Um, and all of these worked hard to build this empire. Now, as I say, this was a 
a, a brutal time. And it wasn't always that this was done with military. So, for example, taking over Nyepo to the north, that was an actual battle. Uh, Tangpo, the area in red there, Tangpo, um, that was actually taken over by Kyungpo. Kyungpo was one of Namri Tsangso's um, generals. He had fled from Changsheng, and he knew that Changsheng would not forgive him for this, for, for fleeing. So he decided to, to take refuge uh, with Namri Tsongsen. And to do this, he cut the head off the king of Tsangpo, handed his lands in entirety to Namri Tsongsen. And Namri Tsongsen gave them back as a gift to him and said, from now on, you are my minister and my general. Okay, so very, very quickly, in the course of about 20 years, we see this enormous expansion of the Yala, out of the Yalong Valley into the areas around Lhasa and Surpu, into the areas around um, Shigatse, where those are all are now. Now, I would hasten to say there are no cities there at the time, okay? Um, these are just, these are nomadic herders, and they are taking over lands that are used to graze their pastures and everything on them. Um, so it's a very mobile place. There are no cities like there are now today. Um, so Namri Songsen has taken Ngepo. He has allied to other clans. He has been given Tsangpo as, uh, as, as a sort of allied territory. Um, and he has brought all of these under his authority. Um, now, can I have the next slide, please? Okay, all right. One of the first things he did was, after this initial expansion, was to give land to the people that had helped him and to the clans that had helped him. Now, you can see the yellow dots there. The yellow dots are the land that he gave really around uh, north of the Yalong Sangpo River, around uh, Meldro, um, north of, uh, 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 northwest, uh, northeast of Lhasa. Uh, and he gave those territories to the people who had made a vow to his father. Those were the central, that was his central commitment. He said, you made a commitment to my father, you gave him your loyalty, I will give you these lands in return. He kept one piece of land, and we, we don't quite know exactly how this happened quite yet, but there are several possibilities. Either he kept the area what, uh, called Rasa, what is now Lhasa, the Kishu River area, he either kept it for himself, or he gave it as a gift to his young son, Songsun Gampo. Okay. Um, we're not quite certain what that is. I'm afraid the, 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 the records from the time are very fragmentary. But we know that he took, that that territory became the king's, the temple's personal territory, okay? Which is why it became so important later and why Lhasa is where Lhasa is now. Um, the other territories in green, he gave as part of the 18 shares of power. That's what they called them, the 18 shares of power. Um, the wrong the wrong the chugit. Sorry, my friend was terrible there. Um, and these 18 shares of power became the basis of what would later be called Per. In particular, they would be they became what became called later the four horns of Tibet. Okay, the four horns of central Tibet. This was what was created by Namri, Namri Songsen, Songsen Gampo's father. And it really gives us the core of that idea of what Per is uh, in southern Tibet in particular. Now, can I have the next slide, please? Okay, now later, that's what they become called. That area that you can see in southern Tibet there, becomes that idea of the four horns of central Tibet. This is named so really by Songsen Gampo and, the, and the, the emperors that came after him 
and seems to be named so in honor of Namri Songsen, in honor of the fact that this was what was created by Namri Songsen. Um, but Songsen Gampo himself um, was a young man at this point in time. He was very young, but like everybody else, he had to take over the rulership at, at the time when he could ride a horse, okay, which is usually about 13 years of age. This actually happened for Songsen Gampo, as far as we can see, potentially even younger. Why? Because Namri Songsen, he may have expanded those territories, but this was a difficult and dangerous time. And many of the areas in, in those 18 shares of power rebelled against him. And Namri Songsen himself was poisoned and died. Um, so this is how Songsen Gampo came to power as a military leader. He came to power and he, he took on Namri Songsen's rebellious empire at this point in time. Everything is in trouble. Um, and he took on his ministers, Kyungpo and Nyang. And as a young man, he seems to have been very forthright as far as this is concerned. And the first job he had to do was to put down those rebellions. And Nyang and Kyungpo successfully do this. And Songsen Gampo himself was personally involved, despite being very young at the time, in putting down those rebellions that came with the death of his father. Not only did he do that, but he then went on to expand the Tibetan Empire even further. Uh, Nyang, his general in particular, took the territories to the northeast, um, the territories called Sumpayur. Okay, this was a large nomadic area, and Nyang successfully Nyang, who himself was born in this in this area, just on the edge of the horn called Uru. Um, he took that territory um, very successfully, very swiftly. Um, and um, really brought it in as the what is often called the fifth horn at that point in time. Uh, not all of this empire building was done with battle, however. Some of it was done with battle and with large numbers of people. Okay, um, we are we we see records speaking about Songsen Gampo commanding armies of up to a hundred thousand soldiers. Um, but some of it was actually done with diplomacy, and some of it was done with a little bit of trickery, as well. So, for example, Songsen Gampo had a sister. Songsen Gampo's younger sister was married away to the king of Shangsheng, but. The king of Changsheng apparently treated her rather badly. He already had a wife and he kind of preferred his other wife. And the new wife was like put out in the cold. Songsen Gampo's sister was put out in the cold. She was extremely unhappy with this. And eventually when the king of Changsheng was making a long journey uh, across the, the four horns of Tibet, she gave a sig signal to Songsen Gampo's armies and they descended upon the king of Changsheng. They beat his soldiers. The king of Shangsheng was executed, and the Tibetan Empire expanded to take all of Shangsheng, all of Western Tibet. At this point in time, Songsen Gampo understands, if I can have the next slide, uh, Songsen Gampo understands that he cannot simply keep expanding with military terms. He does actually expand also by a, a very established system which is to marry, okay? Actually, Songsen Gampo, we often hear in Tibetan histories, we hear about um, Songsen Gampo's two foreign wives, okay? He had two foreign wives. One of them is the Princess Prakuti from Nepal, and the other is Wengcheng Kongzhou from, um, from China. Now, it's important to understand the way wives work in this case. A wife is given by a lower partner, okay? You give a wife to someone who is in a sense your superior at that point in time, either in military terms or cultural terms or diplomatic terms. And to marry in involves therefore to build a relationship with another partner. Sometimes they can be an equal relationship, um, but what happens is then both of you share the same child. And that builds an alliance from one generation to the next. Um, and Songsen Gampo, as far as we can see, he had six wives in total. He had 
Four of them were Tibetan wives, uh, as we would understand it now, uh, from Pe Chenmo, as it were. Um, so, for example, um, we have his wife from um, Changshun, um, who was, uh, is often referred to as um, uh, Pempe Bumo. Uh, so she was a burn wife, um, and she married in and came to central Tibet. Um, we have uh, up from the northern territories, uh, way up in northeast Tibet, around what is now Kokonor, uh, we have Pogma, um, and she was married in as part of an alliance. Um, from Kham, what is now Kham, we have Ru Yong Tong. Uh, um, but also on top of this, we have one, as far as we can see, because there are very few records um, from Liul, or what is called Khotan, way up there on what is now the Taran Basin. Um, we also have, of course, these two other wives. The two other wives, the Nepalese and the, um, his Nepalese and Chinese wives, seem to be quite late. They are quite late in Songsen Gampo's life. Um, indeed, as far as we can tell from the records at the time, <coughs> Wen Chen Kongzhou, the, his Chinese wife, was actually only married to him during the last three years of his life and actually was originally brought to Tibet to marry his son. But his son died early. And so eventually, Wen Chen Kongzhou married Songsen Gampo. Now, here's an important thing. When each of those princesses came to, 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 to central Tibet, one of the first things they did, uh, it was part of the diplomacy of this time, was to build a temple. Now, we know absolutely about three of those temples. The most important, of course, was Rakuti's gift of the Jokhang Temple, or, the, or what it was called at the time, the Rasa Trunam, okay? uh, that is now called, we, we often call the Jokhang Tsudakam. Um, and, but we also know, for example, of course, the Ramoche Temple, was founded by Wen Chen Kongzhou. Um, we know that one of the other ones, the Drata Lubuk Temple in Lhasa, a Chakpuri mountain, this, there is some debate over precisely which princess gave this one. Um, so we're not sure. Some of the others, so for example, the Changchung princess um, gave a, a, a temple called the, the Migmang Temple, but we don't no, we haven't got archaeological records for that. I'm, I'm still hunting. Maybe we will find it soon. Um, so we know that there is a list, particularly in the later medieval documents. There are several lists as to all of these temples. So Lhasa as a place begins to become a place of temples. It belongs to the emperor. It's important to understand here. Again, the emperor, this is not his city. It is what he owns. Emperors at the time move around in a big tent with a whole sort of uh, cavalcade of uh, soldiers that protect him and ministers. Up to a thousand people would move around the empire from place to place, visiting each one in turn, making law, doing legal decisions, all of these kinds of things. But Lhasa became, because it was under the precise ownership and authority of the emperor, that became the site of his temples. And those temples became the basis of the foundation of Tibet as a Buddhist land, as a place in which, for the, when we really see this for the first time in the Liul, uh, the Liul documents, um, but the earliest document is a book called the Waje, um, which says Songsen Gampo was a great supporter of Buddhism, and we, we have that from the, the, the archaeological ruins, from the, from the uh, stone tablets that were put by subsequent emperors, but also that he was a turku, a manifestation of Chenrezig. Um, and this really first emerges in the Leo documents from about the 11th century. Um, so in this sense, we have this sort of two sides to Songsen Gampo's life. We have this early period of time where he is inheriting a very violent and, and, and 
powerful, militarily powerful empire from his grandfather, from his father, onto him. And then we have this period of bringing in subsidiary wives um, who help him build the temples at Lhasa and found Lhasa, not just as a Buddhist place, but also to a certain extent as a burn place. There are burn temples there. Um, the empire at the time, as empires were, were actually was very diverse. It wasn't single and uniform. It was very kind of, um, you can see this even from the 12th and 13th century documents. They, the, emperor, the emperor's job was to oversee all elements of a population in the empire. And they could be Purnpo, they could be Nungpo, they could be of one to, various different religions. There were even Muslim communities at this time, okay? Because just over the west of Tibet, you have the beginnings of the Abbasid Empire, uh, the Islamic Empire there. Um, this was a time of empires, and you had to hold together a diverse population. And you can see this even in the way in which the 14th century book, the, um, the uh, Milong, uh, talks about the Jokong temple, that one bit is for the Purnpo, one bit is for the Nagpa, the Tantrikas, one bit is for the Lamas, one bit is for the people. Um, so uh, the Tibetan Empire at the time was very diverse, very large entity um, that contained many, many different things. Um, and Part of that was to bring in all of the culture that surrounded the Tibetan area and to build a new Buddhist form of governance um, that would oversee Her Chenmo, the greater Tibet. Okay, and I will leave it there. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Martin Mills. Uh, it was a fascinating talk. Um, and I, I remember, uh, before we um, uh, begin this um, program, a doctor did ask us if we have anything in particular we want to know about King Songs and Gambo. And then um, my response to that was, I want to leave it. So we want to look at King Songs and Gambo from a different perspective and, uh, and what a special perspective we have on King Songs and Gambo. Um, we normally associate King Sonzo Kambo, everybody who learns about it straight away, they goes on to talk about the Thumi Sambota and the Michu Tsangma Chutuk and all those. So now it's, it's a very, very uh, different perspective we had and I hope all the viewers uh, online uh, must have enjoyed it. So now we have got some questions here. Um, first one, um, where is it? Okay, um, uh, good morning, Dr. Mills. Thank you for your time. Uh, slightly unrelated to the topic we are discussing today, I wanted to ask you about your research experiences, both in Tibet and Ladakh. Oh, okay, well, I'll have to be short about that, although what we're talking <laughs> there is, is, is 30 years. Um, I first went to Tibet um, in 1986, I was actually just before I went to university. I was I was 18 years old when I first. Well, I was 19 years old when I first saw Lhasa. I was 18 years old when I first entered Tibet. Um, and after that, I I I I visited Tibet for the first time then in 1986, and I stayed in Tibet for six months. Um, I traveled to Western Tibet um, and to Samye and to Lhasa. Um, and really at that point, I, I knew that this was what my life was about. Uh, seeing the place of Tibet itself, um, I understood at this point that, that there was no turning back now. <laughs> um, and so after that, when I went to university, I I studied anthropology in order that I could go back to Tibet, uh, in order that I could study Tibetan culture, Tibetan religion, Tibetan history, and the land of Tibet itself. Um, so I did my uh, anthropology degree. I did my original anthropology dissertation was on um, Nyingma rights to Padmasambhava. Um, then after that, uh, I did my PhD. Um, that was in Ladakh. 
uh, and was really on the nature of uh, authority in Tibetan monasteries. And uh, I spent uh, one and a half and later another time, another slab of six months, one and a half years or so two years sort of in total um, to on working on Tibetan monasteries. I, I worked in a Tansengala region in Ladakh, um, which is just on the border between Ladakh and Zanskar. Uh, in a little monastery there called Lishid Monastery, where they were very kind to me and put me up for six whole months and put up with my stupid questions and my terrible, terrible Ladakhi. Um, and they were extremely kind there, and that gave me my PhD and 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 my you know, the, the the first book. At that point, um, I then in two thousand and uh, three and four, I did work in on. Um, uh, in Lhasa. Um, I went to Lhasa. I was particularly interested, already by this point, I was interested in Songs and Gapo. I was particularly interested. I mean, everything about what I've told you today is the story that we get from the administrative documents, from the bureaucracy that was found in the Dunhuang Caves about a century after Songs and Gampo's death. Um, those were those pieces of paper were written at the time at the very extent of the Tibetan Empire, way north, near the sort of on the edge of the Taklamakan Desert, and those documents were sealed around, we reckon, around the 11th century. They 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 closed them up and they plastered over this room that was full of documents, and. They, th those remained hidden away until the, uh, until 1900, 1904, when they were found again. Um, now those documents are very old documents. It was a, it was a room just like a library. It was huge, full of documents, many of which were just everyday bureaucracy from the empire at the time. So that's what we kind of take from that. What I was also interested in was the stories about Songs and Gampo. That particularly the ones that came from about the 10th century onwards. These stories of Songsen Gampo as Chenrezig. Um, these stories about his, the things we know he did, you know, we know, for example, that Songsen Gampo commissioned the founding of the Tibetan written language. He sent Tommy Sambota to India. He actually sent lots of people, but Tommy Sambota was the one that survived the very, very difficult journey. Tommy Sambota studied. Um, and, and, and learned um, Tibetan as he really carved out Tibetan from the existing Gupta text um, and brought it back. Uh, so we know he founded the, the Tibetan text. We know he made the first written laws based on that text. We believe that he made those from, from what we can see, he made those in Pabonka Castle in the north of Lhasa. Um, he is meant to have gone into a long retreat and come out with a full written version. In fact, when he he when he came from that, uh, when he came out, he declared these and wrote, read it out. And when he read out the laws, that was the point where his the people and the ministers agreed that they would know that 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 his name should really be Songsen Gampo. Before that, it was Tri Songsen. Now it was Songsen Gampo, Songsen the Wise. Um, but there are so many stories around Songsen Gampo, and he is so important. You know, Songsen Gampo is for Tibetans what Lhasa <laughs> is for the English. You know, he is okay. this great king. Um, thank you. Um, um, my apologies to uh, Pemba, uh, Pemba Lamula. Uh, it was a question from Pemba Lamula, <laughs> but it was coming up as admin, so I was thinking it's uh, coming okay. from Tsitsomula. No, it, no, it doesn't matter. Um, my name not being read, that's fine. Can I just ask Dr. Mills one follow-up question? Thank you for that. I think um, um, seeing uh, the story of Song Ching Gampo from a different perspective, that was very interesting. And also just hearing the human side of human story of your own experience. Thank you for sharing that. My follow up question, you were kind of like quite quick saying the names. If I could just get the name of the place where the documents were uh, found. Oh, the Dunhuang documents, D-U-N-H-O-U-N-G. 
Now, thank you very much. Uh, just okay. a few things about that. Um, actually, this was there was a, a monk. Uh, he was a Taoist monk, and he found the cave. Uh, he was trying to renovate the Buddhist temples there, and um, he was running out of money, and none of the local Chinese authorities would pay uh, pay him to help renovate the temples. Um, this is in the early 1900s. And so at that point in time, around 1904 and to 1907, two Western European scholars came and bought thousands of those documents. And they ended up in the British Library and in the library in Paris. So wow. if you want to email me, I'll send you some details. Lovely, I'll do that. Thank you, appreciate. Thank you very much. Um, next, can I request uh, Tengila to ask the question to Dr. Mills, please? Um, firstly, thank you very much for your talk. Um, so my question is, when did the Tem um, Tibetan Empire end and what caused it to end? Ooh, okay, um, the traditional date for the end of the Tibetan Empire was 942. Um, there are, there are several different stories about this. And actually, if you look at what Western scholars write about it, they tend to be very divided. The most established story, of course, was the Lang Dharma. Um, there was, Lang Dharma was the younger brother of the emperor, Rao Pachen. Uh, Rao Pachen seems to have been, from what we can see at the time, it's interesting. Um, the depiction of him varies a little bit in the historical record. He seems to have been a militarily very strong leader, um, but at the same time, they seem to have expanded the empire slightly beyond what they could afford. Um, and the story goes that Rapa Chen's younger brother, Lang Dharma, um, who was himself, the, the traditional story is that he's rather anti-Buddhist, that he was pro Bonpo. Um, we don't know how much that really, really is true. Um, the story is that Lang Dharma assassinated um, Rao Pachen, um, that he broke his neck while he was sleeping. Sorry to be blunt detail there. <laughs> um, and that and took over his position. And then he removed all of the royal patronage to the Buddhist temples. Um, and eventually, Rao uh, Lang Dharma himself was, of course, famously assassinated by Thalung Pa Vidorje, um, a, a monk who was meditating in the, the if you read the Pillar Testament, the Pachen Korma, or the Sawe Melong, all of these kind of early medieval documents that talk about the life of the, um, uh, of the early emperors. Um, the story that comes from that period says that Palom Palgi Dorje was meditating in Yapa um, in a cave and was visited by the protector goddess Paudan Lamo. And Paudan Lamo said, everything has gone very bad. Although you have vows, you really must kill this king. And of course, famously, he uses a bow and arrow that he hides in his sleeve to kill the king. What happens at that point actually is that the, there seems to be in the next generation after Lang Dharma, you get a battleground between his successors and the empire breaks up into several different components. And so you get this period that is often called this, uh, the Subudu, the, um, the period of fragmentation uh, in which everything kind of breaks up and the royal patronage of Buddhism ends. Mm -hmm. So the great temples like the Jokong, uh, like Samye, they don't get royal patronage anymore so instead, Buddhism becomes a little bit more household in its nature. And that goes on until, um, really until about the sort of 10th, 11th century, when you see the rise of the new kings who themselves sponsor, you know, so we have, for example, Yeshe E, who sponsored Rinchen Zampo, who brought, um, who, whose nephew brought Atisha to Tibet, you have Marpa uh, traveling to and fro across the Himalayas to kind of rebuild as, as, as state power rebuilds in Tibet and lots and lots of different little kingdoms. Each one of them, the Sakyas and so forth, begin to sponsor monasteries and big temples again. So really 942 is the classic date. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mills. Um, now, I understand that there are um, many more questions coming in, but we are unfortunately uh, short of time. And therefore, we will not be able to uh, ask those questions. And of course, if you are interested when the Dr. Mills book comes out on Songze Kambo, and I hope you will find uh, more interesting facts and um, answer all your questions. Um, so um, to wrap this uh, session up, can I say thank you very much for uh, Dr. Martin Mills taking your time and um, giving a very good talk on King Songze Kambo. And I'm, I'm sure uh, Tibetan youths as well as um, the older Tibetans must have um, uh, enriched by your knowledge uh, of uh, Songze Kambo. I also want to thank you Tibet House Trust for uh, organizing this talk uh, um, on the occasion of Gratitude Year of uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And I also would like to thank you all for joining live here on Blue Jeans. Facebook um, and on the website and thank you very much with this uh, we uh, end our session thank you all very much thank you thank you I think we are still live on Facebook <laughs> The broadcast of Facebook Live has stopped.